Hello, listeners. Kathy Lawless here, your life story curator, bringing you the podcast series, How Did I Get Here? A series of interviews designed for people who are just starting out in their careers or people who might be in, in transition or possibly feeling stuck and giving them access to stories of people who have successfully navigated their careers, been through the getting started, been through the transitions and getting stuck, and giving you some, uh, maybe some new ideas and inspiration that you haven't tried. Today we're talking to R.H. Hinkson, who is a longtime friend, fellow volleyball player, and just a wonderful person. And R.H. is living the dream. He has been the owner of a very successful business. He's been uh, self-employed. Um, I think he's probably the hardest working person that I might know. <laughs> so welcome, R.H. Thank you, Kathy. And we'll get into a little bit more about what you're doing today. But we have to start with the icebreakers because this is a really fun part for listeners to understand kind of who you are. So where did you grow up? How many siblings? And where do you fit in the birth order? And how do you think that influenced you as a person? I grew up in North Glen, Colorado, was born in Denver General. Um, I have two brothers, and I am the oldest of three. Oh, and is that oldest, I mean, are you the typical oldest? I, that's so funny. I don't know that I can answer that. I'm not <laughs> sure what the typical oldest is. I've never really paid that much attention to that. But, um, you know, now I believe that every, every um Youngest, middle, and oldest definitely have their uh, benefits, and they definitely have their challenges. <laughs> As the oldest, it sometimes feels like um, you're, you're, if you offer advice, um, it's not really wanted because you're, you're the, the oldest. oldest. And if you don't offer advice, then you should have because ah, you're the oldest. <laughs> you should know. You should have helped me. You right. should have guided me and not let me make that mistake. That's right, so funny. I hadn't right. thought about that's exactly. I'm middle, and so that's how I feel about my sister. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me about X, X, and X? And she's like, well, you didn't ask, and I didn't want to be. Right. But it, then there were the times that you got the unsolicited advice, which. Yeah, please stop telling me what yeah. to do. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so three brothers. What's the age range between the three of you? Oh, boy. I'm terrible at this. Um, uh, one and a half and, oh, gosh, I think five. Okay, so it's not like you got to be only child. Um, with mom and dad for you know four years five years before other brother came other brother was there before you even knew what that was probably. pretty quick yes, yeah. yes. Okay. and then um, sports athletics music instruments what did you guys do as for hobbies as kids I played trumpet um, and then in band and then took up guitar because of Eddie Van Halen <laughs> um, <laughs> that's your inspiration oh my gosh yes uh, and then uh, I played I you know track football I didn't play baseball. Um, I guess I did play t-ball, um, and then uh, you know, ton of volleyball. Once I got out of high school. Yeah, but that, when you were growing up, like me, that was the era of you did everything, right? Yeah. Unlike today, I think where most young kids, they you know, they have to specialize. It's so specialized now. Yes, we just sort of you know that was the this this ended, and then you went into the next thing, and yeah. either you played or you didn't. And basketball, I played a lot of basketball too. I enjoyed all that, and that was neat. You were introduced to all sports. Yeah, got to play a lot of things. So, okay, shifting gears just a little bit. Um, on the fun meter, on a scale of one to five, where would you put yourself? One being the couch potato and five being the life of the party. That's funny. That has changed. Uh, I've definitely been a five at times. I've definitely been the, you know, have to be at every party person. And then um, I'm probably a three now. There's a lot more... Um, self time and self reflection and learning and you know i've i've taken up yoga and have gotten very involved in that and that leads itself to a lot of you know introspection yeah so i i see introspective time for you i don't see ever couch potato i don't ever see you just chilling <laughs> that's usually because of exhaustion yeah <laughs> you're either asleep or you're awake and doing something right yes yes <laughs> so on the risk meter same scale scale of 1 to 5 where do you put yourself on taking risks? It's funny. I, I consider myself to be fairly conservative from a risk standpoint. Um, but then, you know, then sometimes I look back or I share, you know, when I had a, a big corporate job that I was sort of set to be a next VP and then left that to take over, you know, to start and or take over my company. And then, and then going from a, 
pretty you know steady job and I was going to take over the big corporate job and we up and moved and took over a job and and it feels like a lot of times I was in way over my head and then had to fill the position but oh. so that you know when I look at those those are very risky I've, I've mm-hmm. definitely but that always that has always felt like to not take this opportunity would be way too painful down the road I'd, I would then have to say there it was there was my there was a chance and I I chickened out, for lack of a better mm. word. So it sounds like you were willing to stretch yourself for a new opportunity, but it didn't feel like a risk until maybe you got in it, and then you kind of went, ooh. That's exactly right. <laughs> when you do those little stock tests where they try and determine your risk level, I never was like, yeah, let's. Let, yeah, I'm not one to go to Vegas and throw the dice, right? I don't, I don't ah. like gambling, but if there's, a, if there's something I can kind of calculate my way through, then I can get that to a point where it doesn't feel risky because I've – you know, I've been able to kind of analyze what, you know, the, then it becomes my efforts can determine the outcome of this decision. Well, and you've got a proven track record amongst you, you know, in your own self. You know, I know when you were younger, you didn't have as much proven record, right? But you kind of had a trust that you knew I can do this. But then once you start leading people, it's like, can we do this, right? And then the, the risk yes. gets bigger. So, well, very cool. I'm sure we'll get into more of the risk taking. I like to set the stage with those two questions just because it's, interesting as we go through your journey as to what is most important to you, you know, and kind of guides and helps us understand how you made the decisions you did. So, so let's talk a little bit about where you are today so that we can then go back into how did I get here? So, you know, I said, you're, you're living the dream. I mean, you have got so much going on in your life right now. Um, and you've had this wonderful career. So tell us a little bit about what, what, what you're doing today. So when I sold the company, um, my wife and I reinvested uh, into rental properties. I come from a family of real estate agents. I'm the, I guess, black sheep. <laughs> I'm the one that, that never really got into real estate. And my father, you know, didn't as well. He ran, mm-hmm. he ran uh, hotels and then uh, was self-employed for a number of years. Um, so anyway, I did that. And then I currently maintain and manage our rental properties. I, I'm teaching myself uh, management of uh, stock portfolio. Um, I, I do a lot of yoga. I do some maintenance at a yoga studio. I do some volunteer work. Um, well, and you're and also teaching on... yourself Spanish too, if I, yes. I was going to ask if you spoke another language and I, <laughs> yes, every day I've been trying to learn Spanish since, uh, high school and every day I dedicate about a half hour or so to, uh, Duolingo and learning Spanish. I love that language. It's beautiful. And we enjoy going to, to, uh, Mexico uh, it's interesting though when you say I'm going to learn a language, right? I don't, I don't necessarily know English. If you were to, <laughs> well, meaning if I were to sit down with a group of doctors, they could use numerous words that I have no idea the meaning, and so sometimes it feels a little uh, self-absorbed to say I'm going to learn Spanish. I'm going to learn to be conversational in Spanish. In Spanish. <laughs> and you're probably. Uh, more proficient than you think you are. I, I, I'm sensing this like you are, uh, well, that you do what I do, which is a, if I want to learn something, I think about it and then I go, well, there's all, I get to a certain point and then I'm like, well, but there's always someone that's better. Like you just jumped right to a doctor. It's like, well, I, <laughs> why, right. why not just a regular person who doesn't even know Spanish? You're that's already leaps problem. and bounds ahead of that. That's the same problem as making Eddie Van Halen the reason you're yeah. learning guitar. You immediately compare yourself to arguably one of the best ever. <laughs> So you're never good enough, Yeah, right? I'm not good at this, yes. <laughs> okay, so you've got a variety of things you're um, spending your time on today, and I know that you enjoy all of those things, and they give you joy, but they also um, keep your mind focused and stuff. So let's... Uh, I started t- writing a lot, and I'm working on some stuff with that, too, so yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're a writer. So let's go back to junior high and high school and you know find out how you got to where you are today. What did you want to be when you grew up, when you were a little kid? It's funny. I remember that con- that question specifically, and I think my answer, I know my answer frustrated uh, the teachers, but I said, I want to be happy. I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, happy. And I couldn't define happy, and they, of course, couldn't either. And they said, well, what profession do you think would bring you happiness? And I, oh, then they so, brought it around to profession. Yeah, race, and... guitar, race car driver or something like that, you know. <laughs> I ride my big wheel around the block forever. But um, so that was it. I wanted to be happy. Wow. As a kid, that's a pretty impressive, a pretty insightful answer, really. Mm. And then they're trying to talk you out of it. <laughs> right. right. No, you need to say something. And I had a hard time with that. 
Mm -hmm. So did that, did that evolve into then once you got exposed to Eddie Van Halen that you're like... <laughs> Yeah, I was going to be a rock star. You're going to be sure. a rock star. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so you're in high school then. I um, mean, did you um, excel in certain classes and thought, oh, now I want to be? You know, a lot of people say, oh, I was great in math and chemistry or biology, so I wanted to be an engineer. Or it's funny. I math was terrible for me. I had the worst time in math. I and then all of a sudden came algebra and calculus, and I was done. I mean, if if I didn't have some uh, friends to <laughs> cheat off of. No, not literally, but well, I mean, at times, yes. But um, I, I just had a hor horrible time in math. But now I love math. I love Excel spreadsheets. I, and so I, school for me was interesting. I was very social. I loved going to school from the standpoint of seeing my friends, ah. but studying. You know, the term, uh, maybe I shouldn't even share this, but uh, you know, you'd go home and your parents would say, well, you know, don't bring your work home. When you get home, it's time for family time mm -hmm. well then the teacher would give me homework and i that was i don't i don't take my I work don't do home work. right well, my parents don't to bring well. their work home so i'm not <laughs> supposed to bring work home <laughs> right i mean i did fine in school it's not like i was a, a bad student by any means but it i i i now know that i learn differently i was the kid in school that uh, when they gave a test i was terrified and then um, I'd still be reading the first question to make sure that it wasn't a trick question. <laughs> and the kid next to me would be done and handing their paper in, which, of mm. course, doesn't help your mental no. state. No, freaks you and, out. Yeah, and then you're they're terrified exit, yeah. and you're not learning and I'm not smart enough and all that noise that mm -hmm. enters. So what, did you have jobs in high school then, like part-time jobs? And I mean, did that kind of get you into a career or? I did. My father always said lead by example you know he 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 instilled a really strong work ethic he and my mom they were both you know very good as kids they 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 taught us how to that we my mom despised the word can't mm. you know, she did not like us to say the word can't uh you, you you're not able to do that now but you to say i can't is i can't period i'm not capable and she didn't like that. It was too limiting. And my father always lead by example. And, they, you know, they both gave us a good work ethic. When I was a little kid, the neighbors were laying sod. And uh, I was in fourth grade, fifth grade maybe. And um, went over and I was going to help the adults lay sod. And, uh, and I wanted to work as hard or harder than them. And I'll never forget this one neighbor said, R.H., you work like a man possessed. And I, to this day, I... I thought that was, you know, I don't know, maybe that means I'm insane, but it, at the time, <laughs> it was such a really neat compliment, you know. Oh, I was, yeah. I was carrying my own, I was holding my own weight or whatever. Well, and your dad would be proud, right? Lead yes, by example. Yeah, and I wanted to make both mom and dad proud, you wow, bet. Wow, that's cool. So you were um, jack of all trades in, in high school then, or I mean, what other jobs did you? I definitely had a mechanical you know, aptitude. Uh, a cousin recently shared a story with me. He said, I came over to your house and he said, you had your bicycle torn apart and it looked like a, a schematic, like it was laid out perfectly. And you, you know, and I'd do that periodically. I'd take everything apart and see if I could make the bike faster through better lubrication of the bearings or something, <laughs> right? And uh, my dad's motorcycle at one point in time, uh, he, he, uh, we had a Honda 90 and dad would chase me around the parking lot. And, um, because I was too short to touch the ground. But um, anyway, so at one point in time, the motorcycle wasn't working right, and I didn't think twice about it. I went out and kind of tore the carburetor apart and, <laughs> and got Dad's motorcycle working. I don't think that I never, I'm not sure it ever crossed my mind how horrible it would be if this didn't work right and I lost all the parts, but uh, anyway. so Wow, so you just had an aptitude and you didn't even know it. You just were curious about, I can make it work better, or what? well, how does this work, and then how do I make it? I can't see where that came from, but yeah, there was a definite curiosity to understand how things worked. And so I was very hands-on, which, of course, was why, you know, sitting in a classroom with a bunch of other uh, kids looking at a book was fine. And now I appreciate books a lot more, but at the time, it just, boy, it was, it was well, so Well, you can't laborsome. touch it. You can't right. see how it, the, the thing, you just have to listen and hear, and yeah, that's, yeah, yeah I get that's not for you. So then what was your first job then? Oh, I uh, I decided that I wanted to have a PV amplifier and um, and a couple other cool things. And so uh, now I understand cost of goods sold and the cost of equipment, <laughs> et cetera. But at the time, I just took Dad's lawnmower. I built a little cart for my bicycle so I could put the lawnmower in the cart, and I attached the cart to the back of my bike, and I'd ride to the neighbor's house, uh, mow their yard, and then I could use the cart to drive the grass clippings out into the field and dump them. So uh, my first job, I guess, was that in a newspaper 
uh, boy with all the dog bites that come with being a newspaper <laughs> oh, deliverer. Geez. Well, and I, you're already, I can see the efficiencies that you brought into your lawn mowing business, right? That the cart also took the lawnmower clippings, which we'll get into. So, okay, so lawn mowing business, then? Uh, then I, um, you know, mom uh, one time said, I can't believe we allowed you to do this, but I, I got a job, I interviewed to be a dishwasher for Coco's restaurant. And I'll never forget, I, I interviewed and then I left and wasn't hearing anything. And dad said, well, you need to do a follow-up call and write a letter. And so, you know, I'm this long-haired kid. <laughs> for a dishwasher, yeah. Yeah, long-haired high school kid. And I did what dad, you know, I mean, I wrote a nice letter. And then I did a follow-up call to make sure that they got my letter, thanking them for the job interview. Well, obviously, I was immediately hired as a dishwasher. <laughs> I don't think they'd ever seen anything like that Overachiever before. for a dishwasher. Thanks, uh -huh. Dad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I immediately became the dishwasher. And then promptly, um, I had this funny, I was... Uh, I was on for Valentine's Day, and unbeknownst to me, there were supposed to be two other dishwashers to help. Well, they all knew what was coming, so they did, they called in sick. So I was the only dishwasher on Valentine's Day and set the Coco's national record for the most... <laughs> Yay, the, well, the, <laughs> yeah, most the most dishes, dishes washed. Wash. Yeah. In and one I, night by one person. Right. Oh, my gosh. And then I was immediately promoted to cook, which, of course, the busing staff was all furious about. So I had one guy that wanted to beat me up because he'd been <laughs> waiting to be the cook forever, right? But he didn't uh, He didn't work like he was a man possessed. You did, obviously. <laughs> right, right. Well, say that training work. So, okay, so let's kind of fast forward to some of these other – how did you get into um, – Corporation and you know more uh, corporate management leadership. Roles. You bet. My father managed a large hotel, and I did maintenance for him for a while. That was an excellent education. Um, and my neighbor had a, a pressure washer company. He hmm. sold pressure washers, and um, I would go in after school and just kind of work in the shop. And then he, you know that I was just supposed to clean and do minor part stocking, so on. Then that led to being a um, I started doing more mechanical repairs because I like that, and then became a, a, um, a technician, so to speak, and then he ended up selling his company to a large corporation. The large corporation came in and immediately let me go because I was a high school kid, and, um, and I, that was right at the verge of whether I was going to go to college or not. Ah. And uh, yeah, and I, I, college was just not something that I felt was for me. It was certainly available. Mom and dad made college available to me, but it just, it didn't feel right. And, um, and so I, I took a job as a mechanic for another company, which is cool. Life tends to give you what you need. It feels like oh, I, yeah. that's where I met Ronnie. She mm -hmm. swears that the day I walked in, she said, I'm, she told her friend, I'm going to marry that man. It oh, took wow. me a little longer to figure it out because guys are slow. I think. <laughs> But um, and so I met Ronnie, and then uh, and then the corporation that had let me go, their service manager. It's interesting. It's sort of the American dream, but it's definitely the uh, not the conventional path. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I literally started sweeping the floors, right? And so then the company that had let me go, the gentleman that they kept, wasn't working out, and so they brought me back to be service manager. And um, and so I took the title of service manager and uh, and were, was managing employees. And that's a moment like, are you how conservative are you? I mean, that's terrifying. Uh, um, but it but I knew that I would regret not doing that. Yeah. And um, so had you had any um, had you managed employees up to that point? No. You'd no. mostly just managed yourself, been a super worker. You know, everything you've done, super successful, now you, you're responsible for other people. It was always mm. just, you know, I used, I say, if it doesn't matter if you're washing a toilet, cleaning a toilet, or, or designing the space shuttle, you know, you do the best job that you possibly can. You sort of leave your mark, right? You, mm -hmm. you, uh, I always, um, you know, when, if someone follows your work, right, they're going to say, who did this? <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they may say, wow. Who did this? Or they'll say, oh, who did this, right? <laughs> it is the same words, but they have drastically different meanings. <laughs> I do. wanted to make darn sure that anybody who followed something that I did said, wow, who did this? Who did this? And again, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter the task. You just take it, do the best job you can, and there's nothing bad can come from that ever. That's so interesting, like the career, you know, climbing the corporate ladder. You yeah. just do the best job you possibly can and, and then see your shortcomings and try and fill that gap with knowledge or studying or whatever and, and or sometimes it's another a person 
right? right. Who brings a different strength so that you can stay in your zone or your strength zone and they can stay in their strength zone. So, so your service manager now, um, that's one of those risks that you were talking about. You were like, ooh, I got to take this, but it was a big risk maybe because, or it felt risky because you didn't have the experience. What did you do to kind of help your, I mean, did you have a role model, a mentor? Was there some leadership programs or management programs that you took or? Absolutely, uh, you know, that it's so interesting. I got a service call at Dallas Lumberjay, I'll never forget. Just and, even saying that is. <laughs> yeah, challenging, right? <laughs> and then of course it's a shop full of, you know, seasoned mechanics and here I am again, a high school kid with long hair, right? And um, so all the intimidation of that and these old seasoned grumpy mechanics, not that they're all grumpy, but. Um, and I went there and they, they had a number, they had a series of machines and they had this really elaborate wiring system. It was, they were remote controlled, different stations, uh, intricate. And I didn't know the difference between 115 or 230 and I didn't know the difference between AC or DC voltage, right? And um, or, I thought AC, DC was a band. Exactly, right. That was <laughs> That's probably the same you're... knowledge I had. Yeah. And, um, and I, you know, I literally sat in that shop and it hit me like I'm in so far over my head here. I'm mm -hmm. service manager. I'm supposed to know everything was sort of my, mm. but you don't have to know everything, right? You have yeah. to, you have to be able to see the, the solution to the problem in front of you. Right. And, and I went to a company and, uh, walked in and said, I'm, you know, I'm kind of in trouble here. I need to learn how these things, how these components work. How does a switch work? How does a timer work? How does a relay work, et cetera. And thankfully there was a, a gentleman there that was, uh, boy, you know, kind of you're in over your head. <laughs> and he started educating me just quickly, gave me this, gave me the plant of the seeds so that I could grasp how this worked and then pointed, you know, gave me a couple books. So kind of gave you some basics. And uh, you said you went to a company. Was this um, someone outside of your company? No, it was or? a vendor. It oh, was a, a, it was okay. a vendor. Okay, so it's kind of a some trusted... of the parts that we bought. Yes, ah. yes. Because uh, you couldn't really admit this and go to your own team. Yeah, or, or you felt like you couldn't, right? Oh, that self, you know, the, the, it's funny, the definition of ignorance, right, is to, uh, to know the sum, basically, I'm paraphrasing, but to know the sum of everything about something, right? So we are all ignorant about everything. I can't, I mean, I don't know, can you name anything that you know everything about? <laughs> no. I mean, a glass of yeah, water. No. You don't know where that glass was manufactured. Yeah. You can figure that out, but it's endless. And then if you start getting into, without sounding like a crazy person, but then if you start getting into the molecular structure of the glass, right, you don't, you, there's a lot that we don't yeah. know. And so to overcome the need to know everything, right, to mm -hmm. overcome, mm -hmm. I'm the manager, and therefore I... Am so wonderful, right? Well, you, you, sooner you can get rid of that, the better, right? <laughs> and just start, you know, continue to learn and continue to improve situations. So you found a, a trusted resource that gave you some basics, and then you being the diving in learner, like you learn by taking things apart and putting them back together, you were able to figure that out and somewhere it clicked, right? And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, then you then you start down that path, and then one thing. You know, you figure something out, this, this simple part of it, and then it becomes more. And it, that led to the point where in the corporate, once I, and later on, and we'll get to that, but I, I became the electrical instructor for the corporation, having no formal electrical knowledge. Mm -hmm. There was a number of books that I read, and, and there was a whole division of people in the company that their manager didn't really want them to understand electricity because it, it provided, um, you know, so it provided some control over these people. And ah. so I would do after hours training. Uh, we'd hide in a room and I'd teach him how electricity worked, <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, and that, pe so he was kind of hoarding the knowledge so that everybody had to come to him. I mean, is that kind of... I, I don't think what? that that's uncommon. You know, he was a, he's a good man. I don't, uh, but that's sort of what was going on. There was nobody, you know, um, for whatever reason, these people were trying to answer service questions on a, on the phone and they didn't necessarily understand how electricity worked. So hmm. anyway. Yeah, which is a hard thing to admit if you're in certain roles and you get so far in. Golly, all that's hard to re yeah. admit. I don't know. You know, yeah. I used to rehearse with some of my employees. Okay, I want you to recite after me. I don't, don't know. know. <laughs> We're going to practice this together so that it's no, it's not such a big hurdle because then we can go. Now we can start running. You know, yeah. As long as, you know, life does not allow fakes for very long. If you don't, you know, you will be found out pretty quickly if you're not what you're saying or pretending you are yeah. and as soon as you get out of that and just so you were a service manager for service manager um uh 
I, I, one, as far as the management thing goes, I, um, I took a class by a gentleman named Bob Farrell. You asked uh, any formal oh, management yeah, yeah. training. And I took a class. It was a, a motivational kind of a speaker deal. And, and he said something that just, I literally was sitting there in his class with tears running down my face because it impacted me so deeply. Mm-hmm. He said that um, as a manager, you know, you are literally in control of people's lives. And that's not a small <laughs> weight to bear. Right? No, no, it's not. And his perspective was, if you contemplate that the average human being has 24 hours in the day, right? Ideally, you're getting somewhere between six and eight hours of sleep, right? And, uh, and you're going to spend eight to 10 at work. I, you know, I think, I'm not doing, I like math, but I'm not quick. <laughs> I think it leaves you, what, six hours roughly that mm-hmm. you have family and friends and you know you need to mow the lawn you got to do the laundry you got all these tasks that aren't necessarily with your family and friends you rapidly get down to where you just don't have you know the average human being does not have a ton of time to spend with family and friends the main point being that you spend a lot of time at work yeah and if you have taken the role of manager and you are you know you can literally ruin people's lives when you contemplate that the majority of their time is with you or you can not you or know, you can you enrich can, people's lives you can lives. enrich yeah. people you can yeah. educate you can help them to find their strengths you can you know it's it was that that way i'm i mean i cannot be more grateful to that man for that lesson because you know you took that to heart and then that's who you were and who you were being as a manager was how, how do i bring this so it wasn't about the the numbers about the productivity, but I mean, it was, uh, you had to achieve those things, but through other people and you found a way to make it work for them and work for you. It sounds like. Absolutely. It's such a circular, circular thing. You know, what's mm-hmm. more important, the employee, you know, the employees are number one. Okay. But if you don't have a company, then yeah. you, there's no results and profit are number one. Cause if you don't have money, you don't have employees. Yeah. It's just... exactly. It's so circular. Right. And then you say, okay, well the company's most important because without the company, there are no jobs for the employees. Okay. But if you don't have any employees and the company it fails, does. right. So <laughs> it's this endless loop. It is. It is. So you, um, sounds like you were again, as while you d- didn't have the formal education, you knew that you needed knowledge in certain areas. So you got it when you needed it. That, that's exactly right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as you think about the knowledge before us, right? I mean, uh, Socrates, Marcus Aurelius, etc. cetera. You know, I was so moved by Buck Rogers of IBM, the IBM way. Uh, the, probably the most influential person for me was W. Edwards Deming, the Deming management method. Mm-hmm. When I read his book, and he was more manufacturing. I wasn't, I worked for the corporate, for the big corporation, and they did manufacturing there, but that was never my role. I was um, you know, I'm jumping all over here, but he, um, you know, he was so, his was all efficiency. And for those that don't know, W. Edwards Deming, right after World War II, and this is a real quick summary, but right after World War II, the Japanese, you know, Japan was trying to rebuild, and he, he had this whole new concept on, on manufacturing, how to make that more efficient. I mean, mm-hmm. if you're right-handed, you put the tool that you're going to use the most within the closest distance to your right hand, that kind of concept, right? Just in time management, you have the parts that you need right there at the workstation so you can speed mm-hmm. things up. It's it's infinite. You know, once you start down that path of improving efficiencies, the the outcome is beyond your wildest expectations. Yeah. Well, and this fit well with your brain when I think about well, I built the cart to carry the <laughs> lawnmower yeah. and then I could transport the clippings on the same cart. I'm like, oh, Brilliant. Yeah, he Brilliant. unleashed okay. me. And you were, what, in the seventh grade probably when you were in that mode. So this was like, ooh. Okay, so this helps with your man-possessed. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's as, a, you know, as an employee or um, being that yourself or as a manager, I don't, you know, most frustration for employees is working in a, a situation where you can't succeed. Mm-hmm. Either because you don't mm-hmm. have the knowledge mm-hmm. that you need or... Um, Someone once said, it's like asking people to throw a strike, and you've never explained them what a bowling – they don't know what a bowling ball is. They don't know – I thought a, you meant in baseball. So, see, it may not even be the same sport, right? Perfect. Yeah, this was bowling. <laughs> like, there's, they don't know what a bowling pin looks like, and you've got a black curtain in front of the pins, and you hand them a ball and say, throw a strike. I don't know who said that, but mm-hmm. it, was a, it, was a, yeah. you know, it was kind of a brilliant uh, analogy because – and then you remove the curtain, and then you point out to them that there's oil in the lanes, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not a big bowler, but, I mean, it, the, it, it made a lot of sense. And, and so that, 
you know, as a manager or as an employee, once then you, you know, then you start getting a taste of success. I've watched people work much harder to get out of the job that they're tasked to do than it would have taken to just do the job, right? And, yeah. and if you can point that out and just give them a taste of, of that success of like, you know, you you did this, you accomplished this, you made this better, you whatever, whatever mm-hmm. it is, you fixed the machine. And, uh, and then all of a sudden you created a monster sometimes. Yeah. I mean, these people then all of a sudden like, wow. And then with that comes all that cool stuff, respect, respect and accomplishments and so on. Yeah, that they have pride in their work and yes. and um, yeah, and are successful. So, so you were service manager for how many years then? And, and by the way, what age are you at this point? Because you keep you it, reference the high school, and I'm like, wow, how young were you? I was 19 when I took over as service manager. Wow, that is young. Yes, and uh, uh, <laughs> Oh, it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I was 19. And then, so then, um, then the corporate world right now, I'm not working for my neighbor anymore. I'm working for a corporation Mm -hmm. and they had a little, and I was such a square peg in a round hole. They had a a little contest and they were, it was all the service departments in the nation pitted against one another. And, um, and so we're doing this contest and they had a little piece of paper that they'd fax you dating myself and it had a little airplane on it and the airplane would go along and you know, based on your sales and my airplane crossed the finish line and we were supposed to get a bonus from that and um and then the contest's over and then the corporate office calls and says um well you didn't you didn't you didn't make it you didn't make the goal i said no 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 my airplane crossed the finish line you know <laughs> well but um, there was some sales that you had that didn't get to the corporate office in time because they had to be mailed, all that kind of stuff. You know, again, it's pre-email. Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, okay, well, then I'd like to tender my resignation. <laughs> said, yeah. And what? And uh, I said, oh, I, you know, you lied to me. I'm not going to be lied to. Oh. And, um, and so, they, you know, they, they said, oh, our mistake, and I got my bonus for my airplane crossing the finish line but um i don't i just wasn't you know it, if we're gonna do this then let's do it honorably right yeah yeah so you ended up not leaving then no i didn't leave and then that lend itself to then we became uh the number one service department in the nation um and you know just from that hard work hard hard work but um and then uh, the Phoenix branch, one of the branches, they had their whole crew left. Everybody left. The service manager left. All the service techs left. There's this major fallout. So they flew me from Denver to Phoenix and had me walk in and work in that service department. And um, that was interesting, right? People would call up and say, is my machine repaired yet? And I'd say, well, not only is your machine not repaired, but I don't know which machine is yours. Oh, Nothing geez. was tagged. And so uh, then they'd yell at you, and then you, I would say, I'm I I'm more than willing to listen to you yell at me um, for as long as you like, but this is time that could be spent fixing your machine. <laughs> if you could just come identify your machine, then I'll fix it. Which was scary because somebody yeah. could come in and pick a ten thousand dollar machine versus a five hundred dollar machine, right? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. But I guess what's occurring for me is what you went from I have to know everything and come across that I know everything. So now you're flown into a situation where you cannot possibly know anything. So it's almost this universal joke yeah. on you, or uh, not joke necessarily, but um, like you said, you were always kind of presented with things that you need at the time, which was this experience of you have to be able to operate in a world of, of uncertainty and not knowing and be okay with that. Right. And look at what you did. I mean, wow, that was had to be humbling, but also... You were able, well, I'm sure you turned this around. We'll get to the story now. So, but anyway, that just occurred to me that you were just thrust into this environment of, of uncertainty and not knowing in any way. Wow. Well, and that's the same thing. It would have been easy to say no, um, easier for yeah, sure. Yeah, you could say, I don't want to take on that mess, right? Right. But you did And that, that, of course, then propelled me into national service manager. Then they said, okay, we want you to come be national service manager, which was another giant Right. Yeah. Well, and how old are you now? Um, 20, how old was I? 20, 25 or 26. Wow. And, um, and I had 13 service departments around the nation and, um, you know, would fly in and, and work at all those. And then, then introduction to the corporate 
world, you know, yeah, which was so eye opening. I went up there. Level. Yeah, the politics and all that stuff. There's a lot of great people there. I'm not saying that, but the politics of the guy that wanted me to come be national service manager, um, he oversold me, right? I mean, I could walk on water by the time I got there. So that caused a situation where a lot of people in the corporate well, world. Let's see how good this guy is. Exactly. And they were all, you know, they were. It was that was a thing. I went in there kind of like, hey, we're going to work together as a team, and yeah, and, uh, right. That, that didn't go over so well to begin. <laughs> there was a large le- learning curve. Um, mm-hmm. I I, uh, I I'll never forget. This was another major, you know, that kind of turning point. Pivotal thing. moment. Oh mm-hmm. my gosh. Um, I went in to meet with the, you know, I just got there. The top management team, a couple people on that didn't want me there, and so there was all that. Um, and so the president owner um, wanted to have a meeting with me. So he pulls me up into his office, and it was an hour meeting of him asking me questions. You know, what's the average daily labor rate in Fresno? What's what's our break even in Bakersfield, et cetera? And I basically sat there and said, I I don't know. I'm not sure. I'll have to look into that. You know, mm-hmm. for an hour, and um, walked out of that meeting. And he, I could tell he was obviously disappointed. And, um, all right, well, we're going to have to get together tomorrow and we'll discuss this further. Walked out of that meeting and there was, a, again, right? Life just kind of hands you what you need at the time if you're receptive to that. But So I walked out of the meeting and there was a gentleman there that I worked with. And I explained to the questions and, oh, my gosh, I'm in big trouble. Um, and, and I'll never, he said, well, you, you just need Excel. You need an Excel spreadsheet. And, yeah, and he taught me, he gave me some pointers on Excel and I knew I was going to be fired the next day, right? So this was sort of a do or die moment. And um, so thanks. I went back to my little cubicle and started working intensely to educate myself on Excel. And he showed me how to set up a basic spreadsheet and then how to push F11 and get a graph, right? And, um, and so I never went home. I called, I called Ronnie and said, I'm not going to make it home tonight, and I'll see you tomorrow, and told her why. <laughs> And I sat there and worked all night, and I created this three-ring binder for all 13 service departments and had break-even and cost per man and so on. I had the data. I just didn't have it memorized, you know. Well, or um, probably analyzed or right. um, evaluated. Or, you know, you didn't have the analytics all calculated, right, to say how did all that play in. Wow. Exactly. And so worked and worked and worked, and and then the next morning, you know. Worked and worked and worked like a man possessed. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we yeah. see this. Everybody came back in the next day, and uh, and then I went upstairs for my meeting with the with the president again, and had my little three ring binder, and he, you know, reluctantly started asking the same torturous questions again, and I'd flipped a page, whatever, and mm-hmm. well, such and so at this branch is averaging X amount of hours per day, and our break even on parts is this, and our part sales here. It's you know, then I could answer almost all of his questions, and at what at one point he said, w- you know, where are you getting this from? I said, just my, my book here. And he, where'd that come from? I said, well, I, you know, I worked all night to put it together. And then he realized that I'm in the same clothes I was in at our, in ah, yesterday's, yesterday's meeting. meeting right? and he's like, oh, you are wearing <laughs> the same clothes. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. But, but he that, also recognized, you know, he, he was sharing with you, the, these are the metrics that are important. And now you have to go get them. But now you have the metrics, but then what do you do with them, Right. Yeah, you know, to stay focused on why are we here? Yeah. You know, they... Mm-hmm. Uh, they Am I just... Are you just testing me or, right? Is is there... Where else are we going with this? Right. They they would... I drove them... I drove them crazy with forecasts and sales goals, too. That never made sense to me. You know, I get goals, right? I set goals for myself. But we'd, we'd spend all this time forecasting for next year and go, sales goals. And I can't tell you whose machine's going to break down and how much the repair is going to be, right? Mm-hmm. And and I always thought it was just an utter waste of time. I I can, I'd lay out here's all the things that I'm going to do to increase productivity and efficiency in the de- departments and educate and so on and so forth, and um, and then we'll just work as hard as we can and do the best job we can and see what happens, right? And we would shatter sales goals. I mean, we'd shatter previous year's goals uh, just from that. You know, you save a second or you know, and I'm not this, I'm not this insane, but <laughs> you know, you start. You know, when you take inefficiencies out of a work process, um, so many things improve. Mm-hmm. You know, morale, et cetera, like I was saying earlier, when people, they want to do a good job and they can't because of the system. 
And yeah, uh, what comes before them, what comes after them, what they know about both of those things as well as their own job, right, in terms of their success. So all of that. Well, all right, I can't believe we are about 45 minutes in already. And we haven't even talked there about the business that you own. So let's jump there, if you would, because yeah. I, I think we've got a really good sense of how um, how dedicated you are, how how deep you go on certain things when you get involved in stuff, which is just very cool. But it's also a great lesson because look at how it got you noticed at a very young age and got you promoted at a very young age. And yet no college, no vocational training necessarily. It was all on the job training, but your own diligence. So I applaud you. This is, well, this you. is great because this is what listeners need, right? Is what are those things that make people successful? And there isn't one just path. It's kind of knowing a lot of ways that successful people end up being successful. So, so okay, so you're now your national service manager. How did you get to be your own, you owned your own company? I mean, that's a big leap. Yes, that was, a, that was interesting. So um, uh, half of the branches were losing money in the service department, half were making money. And we got it to the point where all but I think one, one was right at break even, but the rest were making money. Wow. Well, Impressive. unbeknownst to myself, I worked myself out of a job, right? Because that was sort of the big corporate goal. They wanted to get, they were over the branches. They wanted to get them profitable and sell them. But the good thing was they were selling them to the branch managers. So the, the branch that I had literally worked up from sweeping the floor for my neighbor, that corporation bought it out, et cetera, um, that was being managed by um, what ultimately became my partner. And he he couldn't buy it by himself, and so I bought that corporation with him. And How cool. Well, this is totally the American dream. When you said you, you know, you did the American dream, and now you're, you, sw- you were sweeping the floors there, and now you're a business owner. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And, that, and the faith that the corporation had, and specifically the, the CFO, I guess, and the, and the owner had in me, because I, there was a period of time there where I worked for the corporation and owned one of the dealerships. So talk about a raging conflict of interest. Mm. And uh, mm-hmm. for instance, one of my then employees, because then I became national parts manager for just the parts department for the corporation shipping manager. And um, you know, one of my employees would come to me and ask what what you know what price we should give the Denver branch on such and so. Ah. And uh, you know, my response was always, well, you know, what's our protocol and what did we do for other dealerships, et cetera? We just you know do what we do. I didn't. But there yeah. was boy, there was an avenue. There was, so for them to have the faith in me that I would handle that, and then and then ultimately I had to make the decision to leave the corporate job and just go run my corporation, and then. Um, then that turned into owning that by myself. Um, so for how many years? Buying my partner out. I, Fifteen years 15, I had my company. Wow. And so at what age did it. you start this business, or you know, step into that role? Oh boy, that—that's um, funny. You're still before the that. age of thirty. I mean, when, right I'm, at, when I'm thinking about your timeline here, I want to say that was right at about thirty. I guess. Yeah, I'd have to give you the. I'd have. Huh, I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to look that up. But you're right. And then 30. sold it when you were forty-five. Yes. Ish? Okay. Yeah. Wow. 15 year run. Yes. And I'm assuming you approached it the same way you've done everything else, which was, well, what do I need to be to be a successful business owner? And how do I take care of my employees and your, <laughs> Oh yeah. There's so many books, you know, how to win customers and keep them for life. Everyone should read that book just for life. You know, it, it was always, it was always, you know, how would I like to be treated if I was in this person's mm-hmm. place you know I mean whether that, they worked for you or they were your customer or they were your boss you treated them all exactly mm-hmm. for customers for sure you know that's an avenue where it's they don't know you know you can really trick people if that's what your motive is and uh and so you know take take people out and explain to them what we were doing and you know there was times where an employee would make a mistake and you know I changed the guy's six hundred dollar pump well that wasn't the problem there was a Something was clogging the nozzle. I mean, these are terminology that doesn't mm-hmm. matter, but the yeah. point being that the, the, the customer did not need a $600 pump, and we would make that right. You know, we didn't, that was, my mechanic made a mistake, and we'd undo it and, you know, credit the guy if that happened. Uh, you know, that was found before the, the machine left the shop, but. Ah, anyway. uh, okay. And as a, a business owner, um, what, uh, what were some of your pivotal moments there? Well, that was ongoing with, uh, you know, with the employees. I think the biggest thing, you know, I, I, at one point in the corporate world, I was sort of a quote unquote hatchet man. I mean, my job was to go in and find weak spots in, in companies, in dealerships. 
It's because you were looking to make them profitable and more efficient and all that, right? And sometimes that meant we don't need as many people. Right. If well, we're more or, efficient or... Employees are so interesting, right? I always, I always said attitude is the one thing that I can't fix, right? Mm. I can't fix attitude. Work ethic you can even do a lot with. I mean, you can... If somebody has a kind of a poor work ethic, you can... You, like I was saying earlier, you can show them what it feels like to be successful. And then that just... You know, then that... You know, not that that always works, but you could... That's something that you could fix. And knowledge, for sure, you can fix, right? If somebody doesn't know something, but they have a good, ac- good attitude and a strong work ethic, then you can, you can plug in knowledge, right, and then make them, you know, uh, not make them, but, I mean, then they, they become successful and it becomes a good deal. Um, so that was something that was always the, 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 the employee relationship, um, right? Uh, I, I tried hard. Employee reviews used to drive me crazy because you'd sit down and review a person. Yeah. You know, what'd you do right and what'd you do wrong and all this stuff and how well do you get along with your coworkers. It was all such general terms. Uh, probably the biggest thing that I learned was uh, helping all of my employees to have an owner mindset, right? So at one point in time, my, my partner uh, at the time suggested paying the mechanics on commission. To me, that was a horrible idea, right? Because... Uh, you know, just that earlier example about a pump, you could pretend like there was a part that was bad and the employees could just, you know, a mechanic could make a lot of money yeah. putting parts on machines that the customer didn't need, right? So ultimately that that dwarfed into where I I created a financial statement for all of my employees, right? I, I, I introduced them to variable expenses and cost of goods sold and fixed expenses. Fixed expenses you can't do anything about. You you occupy this much of the building and this building is this and you know that that I didn't go into great detail because as the owner of the company I you know there's some things that were yeah. you know they didn't Your decision. they didn't need to know my salary mm-hmm. right um, but it needed to be in line in order for the company to make to be yeah, successful yeah it couldn't right? be off the charts because then that wasn't going to work for the company either yeah. exactly so I created this financial statement and talk about removing the blindfolds right um, then all of a sudden these it, it was just so awesome I mean then these people would come alive right like. They understood, you know, if you if you close the shop door and we don't heat the outdoors, that makes a difference, right? Then your heat costs go down. They started thinking, you know, it was it was, it was awesome to watch the human mind develop, right? And then they then they all of a sudden same thing. Then they started shattering sales records, and I I pay them a percentage of of the change that they made. You know, what did I care, right? I mean, and maybe there's, I'm sure there's plenty of business owners that would disagree with the, with this approach, but. I have a hundred percent of nothing, right? I mean, my my employee is so successful right now. Well, if they bring another dollar to the equation, I'll give them twenty cents of that, mm-hmm. right? And 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 I always so, was sort of like, I don't care how much you make, right? Because I, if you design it properly, I make you know the company makes more money if they make more money. Yeah. And why would you not want to reward them for making more money? So yeah, there, again, there shouldn't need to be a cap. Right. If we're all, if all, all boats are rising, then why, why would you put a cap on that to say, well, the mechanic shouldn't make more than X, right? And sometimes people can get in that mindset of, I don't want to pay more than this for that role. Well, wait a minute. And talk about a major expense. You yeah. Know, to bring somebody new into the company, to go through the process of trying to figure out of these people who you're going to choose to bring into the company, to train, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then find out, gosh, it doesn't work and have to let them go and do that again. You talk about a a, comp- a total expense with no return is hiring, training, losing, right? Oh, yeah. And then the whole point in between of the, the angst while you're going through, should I keep them? Are they going to stay? All of that. I mean, that's... And I then it's toxic no to the group and all of that. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's I mean, some you always learn, but anyway. Well, all right, so we could talk yeah, all, I'm so sorry. All I feel no, like I've rambled is, too No, much. this is amazing because this is these are the things that... Um, you know, so, you know, the lesson here is, well, if your employees know more about the business and think of it more like an owner, then they're going to act differently and they're going to feel more empowered and they're going to understand. So, I mean, there's so many great lessons here because that's something that all of us can bring to um, to whatever role we're in. You know, sometimes you don't have the information may not be there, but if you're not curious about maybe going to get the information and finding out more about the why or what or how all the pieces work before and after me, and you just want to sit and blame other people, I mean, that's that's not going to make things successful. So, um, so yeah, so I think those are great lessons. But So we do need to wrap up. So I guess there's one last question I would ask, which is um, what do you think is the smartest thing you ever did? Uh, when you look back on your whole career, what do you think is that, that what one thing maybe that, made you so successful? I guess finding my path, right? 
um, I, I, to, to uh, you know, to do what was in front of me the best I could. Mm-hmm. I, I mm-hmm. shared that college wasn't for me. I'm, I, I mean, I may go to college now, right? But at the time, it was, it was not for me. And um, I, I realize that there's professions. You can't just go read a few books and decide that you're going to be a doctor and do brain <laughs> surgery tomorrow. I, I understand that for sure. But uh, there's a TED Talk about multi-potentialites. And again, to, to know that, um, that, that there's a lot of potential... There's a lot of different options that you can be good at, and uh, there's definitely success in the non-traditional route. So I think probably the best thing I did was, and then for sure to not say no to opportunity just because it's scary. Mm, You know, have mm -hmm. enough faith in yourself that you'll work through this. And the worst case scenario, worst case is that you fail, and then you learn from that. I mean, there's so many brilliant people of the past that say that which is so true you learn from your failures make sure that you learn from them and uh, well on and, and one hand you could even say was it really a failure it was really just a learning and it was it didn't go the way you expected you know does that mean it's a failure i mean sometimes that word is a yeah you know, yoda right yeah. there is no do <laughs> yeah there is, there is no, no try. try do or yeah right and <laughs> i think the ultimate failure is to not try when there's something that you mm-hmm. want to try try and look forward to failing if, you know, again, there is, yeah. failure is just an awesome educational Yeah, so look experience. forward to learning. <laughs> right, 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 exactly, and maintain that. Well, and I see that in what you're doing now. When we look at your writing, your, you've got all these properties that you're managing, you're learning a new language, you're managing your investment portfolio. I mean, you're, you're, you're just t- kind of taking what you do and who you are to every element of, of what helps you earn income as well as brings you joy and... Um, and brings your brain, you know, energy and juice, so. For sure, and, and not, uh, you know, we all want to know it all, right, immediately. You want to take that pill where you know it all, yeah. right? And, uh, and, then, and then once you've done that, right, when you theoretically became whatever, the best mechanic in the nation, mm-hmm. um, then, then, then you, you, it's almost damaging in the way that you, then to go and start over again, right? When you, when you type something in Word and Word has correct, corrected almost everything, <laughs> you type, it's hard to think, yeah, I'm going to be a writer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you have to go back and, and sort of uh, be willing to start the whole process yeah, over again and enjoy over. that, right? Yeah, enjoy, enjoy learning what you don't know. Well, RH, this has been amazing. We've been such great friends for so long, but I still have never heard your story in this way. I've heard parts of it. And so thank you for sharing that. And listeners, I hope you enjoyed RH's journey and his career path. And um, if you have questions for RH, please put them on my website, lifestorycurator.com, or questions for me for future podcasts and maybe interviews or career paths or topics that you'd like to, uh, to see included. So subscribe to the podcast. It's on Apple, Google, podcast channels, YouTube, etc. So look forward to uh, future stories. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy.